Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, I've been asked to say a few words underscoring the importance in realising integrated materials management. So uh, before I start, I should uh, say a few words about myself. So Martin Swain, I'm the uh, Shell 4D, 5D program manager. Um, <clears throat> I would say my original background is uh, design and modifications of instrument control systems. Um, I've worked closely in collaboration with construction since 94, so sad to say 20 years. Um, offshore North Sea um, and then FPSO design in uh, the east of uh, northeast of England. Then uh, onshore West Africa in Gabon, uh, dealing with post bulk construction, so remaining scope. Uh, then completions and then handing over to uh, commissioning and pre-commissioning. And now I work with the uh, 4D, 5D program with Shell. Um, I suppose the simple thing to say with 4D is, is the mission sort of statement. So we, we aim to uh, use technology in construction. Uh, that four key points really there is to improve productivity, plan and execute work safely, uh, provide transparency and visualization on progress, and in real time data available from home office, site office, and the mobile device. Uh, so it really is what we're trying to achieve. Um, in reality, I could say there's 20 bullet points using all the keywords you've heard before, predictive, analytical, track and trace, etc. But I think the core activity that will deliver our goals are workplace planning and in particular advanced work packaging um, using technology, um, not the uh, traditional, uh, I suppose applying the paper-based system but using technology to do it. So uh, this will deliver the productivity improvements that we're looking for and at the same time allow us to plan and execute that work far more safely and provide us with a far better environment for monitoring, reporting and controlling progress. I should point out that I'm the, also the Advanced Work Packaging Information Mapping AIM Fear Tech Project Lead, so for those people that know me through there, hello. Um, on AIM we are systematically determining information resources needed to enable the realisation of advanced work packaging, but that's, that is not enough. A key pillar to realise our goals is really to elevate our thoughts on material management practices. I think as an industry we should, probably should challenge ourselves with this question. Do we honestly have visibility, predictability and control across the whole materials management supply chain? Um, now, if, if I pose that question to you, you may say in, in your world, the answer provided is, yeah, of course we do. Um, but quickly followed by, accept items not in my scope or under my control. And I think that's one, that is the issue that we face. On one hand, I wonder if this is um, not even seen as a problem. It's just part of business as usual. We have a significant amount of non-direct construction people on site or in the back office expediting uh, material management information, um, tracking top-ups, logistics, warehouse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, uh, well, on one hand, we may regard this opportunity for significant improvement as being simply too big and complex to achieve. However, if we look to the manufacturing automotive and aviation industry, it's clear that they've come a long way over the last 20 years in identifying and substantially reducing inefficiencies. The point here is if we are, uh, we are not inventing anything new, we understand adapting and capitalizing on practices that have already been proven in other industries. So finally, in closing, uh, if we agree that we need to improve our materials management practices, the question is how? And I think from talking to Reg over the last couple of days, um, no one else is going to change the future. It's not like in five years' time, this is all going to be fantastic. So the only people that are going to change the future is us. And I think uh, this is this is one of those areas that uh, that we can really achieve uh, from shaping the future from this point moving forwards. So um, finally, there's uh, over 180 registrants for today's webinar, representing over 85 organisations. 80% 80 of you indicated moderate to high familiarity with materials management, on large capital projects, and 77% of you indicated reasonable to significant amount of understanding of the limitations and deficiencies of current materials management practices. So this is all very encouraging. And now I will hand you over to Fiatech. 
Great. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, this is Reg again. Let me start off with a safety moment. And some of you may, may have heard this, but it tends to be it, it tends to resonate a lot with me. It turns out I had a safety moment in a, in a conference that involved being cognizant of where you are in your hotel and not being complacent just because you travel around. And uh, the, the, the gentleman made the point that you really should know where your exits are and you really should be uh, ready to be mobilized and get out of the building in case of a fire. And it, it's just bizarre. That same night, the hotel I was in had one of its wings caught fire and I was running up and down 12 stories because uh, uh, you can't use the elevators uh, because of the fire. So uh, for everyone from a safety standpoint, just be hypersensitive to the fact that just because you have an experience of fire, it could happen. So be aware. OK. So we have a, quite a full webinar today. It's going to sound a little bit like us being auctioneers, but very quickly, I'll talk quickly about the Fiatex Integrated Material Management Project um, to drive and facilitate industry adoption of, best, uh, of, of preferred practices. What we want to increase understanding of material management resources and, and the challenges relating to coordination across capital project networks and why, and why that's so difficult how cloud-based information technologies can enable end-to-end -end visibility and control, and uh, why systems are so hard to extend to partners, and at last, highlight some representative industry use cases and solutions. So on your screen, uh, on the right hand of your screen, you'll see a little orange, a little orange box with an arrow in it. You can make it larger or smaller. And uh, in the in the field that you see marked here is you can actually enter a question. Um, I'll be monitoring your questions as the, as the webinar is uh, conducted. If if there's an important clarification we need right then, I'll inter interrupt Rich to um, to answer it. Um, or I will ask him at the end. And lastly, if if you don't get an answer in either of those two cases. We'll be following up in a, uh, in a response to you after the presentation. So uh, Martin touched on this just briefly, but there is some studies. There's been many studies, uh, but one of the key studies that gets frequently cited is from CII, and they are looking at the implications of advanced work packaging on uh, on performance and cost. And uh, their analysis show up to 25% increase in productivity could be realized and a reduction in total installed costs of 4 to 10%. And depending on who you talk to, this is kind of like uh, people are a little skeptical about those numbers, and but they're perfectly happy with citing numbers that are significantly lower that, but the, the, va the value of that is still substantial. And so that's probably one of the biggest motivations for it. But the devil's in the detail. It's not just a matter of, you know, your process map, your process flows, but it's also you have to have an environment that's conducive to realizing advanced work packaging. Okay. So uh, what you're going to hear about today is um, materials visibility, predictability, and control related to cloud-based information management. Um, but it's really a complement to our AIM project, which also Martin mentioned. Um, if you think about it, uh, what AIM does is it, gets, it identifies the resources needed to conduct certain activities related to installation work packaging and advanced work packaging. But you know, knowing where the information is is, is just part of it. You, you also have to be able to confirm what the material status is, uh, what its uh, condition is, and whether or not it's available to be put into a work package, for example. So that's why you see these two simultaneously on the screen. So Fiatech is, um, hopefully most of you know, since 89% of you have, have indicated your members, Fiatech is essentially a bunch of subject matter experts, but more importantly, they, they tend to be, a way to look at Fiatech members is they're wayfinders. They look at problems and figure out ways to get from uh, a current set of problems through the, through the gauntlet of uh, the maze and come up to a viable solution that can be used by the industry. And we have over 100 organizations involved uh, right now with over 20 active projects. And what you can see in the table on your right is how, is how we partitioned out the, um, the different categories uh, into different areas. So um, this image is sort of an attempt to help people visualize the complexity that we face in dealing with multiple stakeholders across the enterprise. And so uh, I won't drag you through all that, but clearly what you really have to do is have a solution that allows you to tra traverse across all these different silos in order to provide complete real-time actual information, both forward and backwards across the entire life cycle of the project, okay? So, Fiatek has many projects, and I'm just highlighting six of them here, but um, the purpose is to realize end-to-end -end visibility, predictability, and control. 
uh, within this umbrella uh, initiative. And um, for example, we have generated a material management productivity improvement guide, which I'll share with, with, with you. Uh, if you send me an email, we'll send you a follow-up email about it. And we have a variety of other projects that relate to taking KPIs to the next level through predictive performance indicators, uh, global material information, which is data-centric access to all detailed product information that's maintained by suppliers, integrated project dashboards, and, and materials risk mitigation. So one of the, one, this is my last slide. So one of the things that I really want to, to say here is that to me, materials isn't something that you drop on your foot. It, it, it's not. It's really much more than that. It's both the physical item as well as the related documentation. And not only for a specific purpose at a particular time, but across all life cycle phases. So anytime you hear the word materials uh, coming from this presentation or coming from Fiatech for that matter, we mean everything, okay? Because to miss anything means you don't have the materials available in a form that allows it to be used and are maintained. Uh, so having said all that, uh, uh, thank you for coming. We have 106 people involved uh, and Rich, it's yours, thank you. Yeah, thanks Rich. So um, E2Open is, is happy to be uh, part of Fiatech and to uh, actually participate in this conversation about uh, the role of networks in the capital project industry. Um, we're going to cover uh, some of the challenges that you know other industries face, like uh, Reg said, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, CPG, industrial manufacturers, high tech and telecom have have uh, faced some of these similar challenges, and um, we're going to talk about um, some some approaches that uh, we might consider. But uh, first, what I'd like to do is unpack the definition of integrated materials management. I think. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it sort of um, <clears throat> implies a mastery of capital, resources, <clears throat> and information flows. And um, what's so unique about this is that of, of those three, it's the information flows that actually always are chasing the other two. They always seem to be behind the process. And this has an impact on, in terms of project execution, which we're, we're going to review here today. So let's let's talk about materials management. Where, where are we really now? Um, I think that it's fair to say that uh, projects are becoming more and more complex, and, and this is having a large impact on our organizations as, as it impacts uh, revenue. Many of the projects are delivered late, and as Reg said earlier, the con Construction Industry Institute estimates that you know, about 80% of the delays in one way or another can be traced to materials. And so this is a significant issue in terms of our overall performance. Um, and as, as you can see, that the, when we can't manage something, we tend to try to shift the risk to other partners. So to the extent that we can get our arms around this, uh, I think we could make the situation better for actually all stakeholders. Now, one of the things that we do need to uh, go through today is in terms of you know, acknowledging sort of the limited success we've had in extending enterprise-centric systems out into the network. And, and there's some fundamental reasons behind that that uh, we're, we're going to talk about. So first of all, supply chains. You know, why, why are networks different than supply chains? I think the first thing to notice is that supply chains sort of um, imply a linear sequential relationship. And as long as information had to flow through that linear sequential step process steps, it was subjected to a yield or subject to degradation. Um, in fact, we might want to do a thought experiment on this for just a second. So just imagine a process that is six steps long. It could be really any process, a procure to pay, a logistics process, really anything. But if you were to ask the owners of the process, you know, how good is your process? I think yeah, every one of them would say, gosh, you know, we're 90% we're good. We're, we're pretty accurate most of the time, I, at least 90. But if you take, and you take that through a sequential process, you multiply those six steps, what you get is a 50% information throughput accuracy, which is, which is unacceptable. And so what happens is, is that we put people in between those processes to sort of judge and manipulate and change the information from one step to another. Now this is okay. The problem is, is that it creates a system trust issue. And that is we start making conditional commitments to each other. We start second guessing the inputs and the outputs. And what inevitably happens is we have to add in buffers. And that it comes in the form of slack times in projects, lead times in material component, um, and inventory. We buffer up and down the, the network in order to be able to achieve the performance that we really want. And then the last thing that we, I think, need to 
recognizes that while we all seek to have more control, we really have delegated a lot of this work to our partners, and we need to trust our partners. But we need to verify with them that, and, and collaborate with them when the project is on track, and when it's not, we need to work closely together and to orchestrate outcomes and solutions to get back on schedule. So let's, let's look at a large-scale project, let's say maybe a refinery, and, and, and look and see if we can understand this concept of a network a little bit better. So if you look at it, um, let's say the owner is going to build a refinery and, you know, before they can commission it and sell product, they have to build it, of course. And building it is, and constructing it is actually the center of the whole life cycle. Uh, there are the design elements that have to happen, the, the buy elements, the procurement that has to happen, and obviously after the commissioning in, in the run and maintain phase, there is the service elements that have to happen. So it's a very complex network in and of itself. And you can imagine the opportunities for air for information to flow too slowly. So look at it from the owner's point of view. So I think the owners uh, are clear about this. They, they really want better project oversight, um, but they recognize that they have just a limited staff in order to be able to do that. And they really do have to delegate the work and the trust to multiple stakeholders. And oftentimes there are multiple engineering contractors or, or, um, or con uh, construction contractors. And this makes the flow of information between them much more difficult and adds time and adds complexity. So I think the owners, by and large, have to admit that the, their EPC contractors have pretty good systems that are well tied out with their, their, their workflows. Uh, it's just that when the information has to flow outside of their organization is when we start to see the problems. So given that, and then knowing that we're going to, at some point in time, have to um, commission the, 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 the project itself and get all of that information back into a system of record that the owner will use and run and maintain for many years to come, there's a lot of work required by all parties in order to get that information in a usable format for the owners. And this is an area where we all could work together to make it better and simpler. So let's look at the front end engineering and design phase. So obviously the owner uh, engineering and the, um, has a, a pretty large task ahead of them. They have to come up with a, you know, sort of a multi-tier acquisition strategy so that they can harmonize the spend across all of the stakeholders in the project. Um, you know, they'd like to use their master service agreements and leverage the contracts that they already have in place. Uh, they have preferences around some types of contracts for one uh, stakeholder versus another. Some are on bid, some are T&M. Um, and then they're very much aware of the fact that the data that is it flows throughout the network changes. So the same part might have a different part number depending on who is buying it. And certainly as the, those parts are changing and value is being added to them, it changes the routings, which change the lead time. So lead time is a really big, big issue here because it is one of those, those buffer elements that we could go after and, and improve. And then the last thing is we all want to make sure that whoever is managing whatever data, that they're only looking at the data they should be. So it's a, we really need to be thinking about role-based workflows and the, and the exchange of information um, to the parties that have a need to know. Uh, the handover strategy we talked about before, all of this information has got to get back to the owner in terms of, you know, drawings, the data sheets and models, uh, compliance certificates and maintenance repair information. And, and that in and of itself is a huge task. If all of this information was sort of wired together uh, with a destination in mind, then that information would be available to the owners when they do need it. Now lastly, let's, um, let's look at uh, the detailed design and network planning. Here is where the multi-tier collaboration and execution comes into play. So there's lots of information moving about the network in terms of fabrication, inspection requirements, quality requirements. Uh, there's this, this real challenge about, um, about needs in terms of material. So an allocated buys, meaning that um, you know, there's only so much supply of certain critical materials um, in, in the industry and in the market. And some of these projects have you know, pretty long lead times and use an enormous amount of material. And those buys need to be allocated among partners. And so knowing what the aggregated amount is and the allocated amounts that each partner is managing is critically important to achieve the best prices, but also in order to be able to manage them properly. So the whole notion of being able to manage bulk orders, custom orders, discrete orders, and have them all tied together in a sensible way so that we understand what our real needs are 
is, is an important. So lastly, in the, in the procurement and construction uh, phase, as you can see, then there's more material, uh, multi-tier collaboration and execution requirements, uh, shipping and receiving visibility, logistics visibility, and basically the ability to project inventory into the future. So I mean, what we're really interested in is that, you know, a ship that, uh, you know, contains um, uh, uh, a shipment of, of critical components, uh, you know, has a long journey across an ocean, and it ought to be reflected into the projected supply when it is needed um, on the project due date. And so by doing this and knitting the process together, we have a much finer grain control over the inventory as it moves throughout the system, as it is stored, and as it is used. And then lastly, as we talked about before, the startup and the handover process, getting all of this information from the contractors back into the hands of the owner is really important. So what are the five steps of an integrated materials management system? Let's, let's talk about that. So first of all, you want to leverage a business network, um, you know, one that's already existing, hopefully, that is capable of a multi-tier data capture. So getting data from anywhere in the network, even if it's multi, multiple tiers down, and, and be able then to integrate a process to those data collection points that then all the project stakeholders can actually use. Next step would be to model the procurement and the project processes across that network. Because what we want to do now is to set up a condition where we can proactively monitor and then execute informed decisions based on exceptions as they occur. And then number three is then use material and service requisitions as planned due date triggers. So combine work activity with material and, and make them meet together in a date and then we can know the dependencies on each other and we can have a, a much earlier uh, view in terms of uh, any exception that might happen. And then we'll monitor those actual shipments, the receipts and service completions against our project plan. And then lastly, we're gonna plan our work outcomes and then proactively alert stakeholders when there are delays or, or problems that occur. Then we can use network level response planning. So we know the problem, we know what the magnitude of the problem is. We can then model the network uh, supply that is available and move supply around, maybe even between projects in order to satisfy that demand. And in that way, we'll be able to keep uh, the project on, on track and on schedule. So lastly, one of the things I'd like to do here is just sort of propose sort of a basic way of thinking about this. Um, as you can see, the, the life cycle up above, sort of try tying it to sort of a a rough idea of how the architecture might look. You know, at the bottom, there really does need to be um, a network layer. And that layer is where the connectivity is happening, getting the data from the partners, whether it is um, you know, B2B or otherwise, um, and have a process management layer then that is, is utilizing that data and actually making predictive um, recommendations in terms of outcomes in the future. And then doing network planning in response and being able to analyze the execution performance of the project as it is occurring. Now, the four buckets above, they could be anything, but, you know, in, in fact, that's hopefully one of the things that uh, the IMM, IMM team is going to first tackle, which is sort of the use cases and prioritize what are, where the low-hanging fruit really is in order to get um, a quick uh, value. But I think that um, some of these elements will probably be involved, and that is sort of the field data integration, you know, capturing the data, moving it in between partners, and then wiring it up to a process. And uh, it's important that the project and procurement processes do connect together because they're so dependent on each other. So having the ability to be able to look into both and, and, and orchestrate both of them is important. Obviously, uh, KPIs and metrics are going to be generated as the, as the project progresses. And then the opportunity to be able to connect this to contracts is, is really interesting. Um, the ability to be able to, um, you know, do a three-way or perhaps even a four-way matching process automation of, you know, not only an order, but a shipment, but and an invoice and a receipt, but also the compliance to a contract. And if we could streamline that, that, would, that might be a really big win for all parties involved. So what, with that, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to my colleague, Pawan Joshi. Uh, Pawan is the VP of Strategy and Technology for E2Open. He's very much involved in, in all of the industry solutions um, that, uh, that we uh, encounter. 
And what he'd like to do then is, is, is take you through sort of the detailed view of how you might implement um, an integrated materials management process. So, so Pawan? Thank you, Rich. Um, P2Open is extremely excited to be a part of this uh, FIATIC initiative. And what we really wanted to do was walk you through um, a quick thought on what these five steps that Rich uh, identified would look like uh, from a technology and solution standpoint. Um, and again, these, these, these ideas, these opinions that we want to um, kind of take out uh, to, to the IMM team are, are really based on our experience across multiple industries, aerospace, defense, industrial, high-tech, CPG, uh, as well as uh, uh, oil and gas. Uh, so let, let's, let's walk down these steps um, in, in a little more detail. So step one was really being able to leverage a business network, right? So the theme really is moving away from linear uh, handovers of information, linear handovers of material into a true network that allows you connectivity across multiple tiers simultaneously. And the key, key underpinning of this is to be able to establish and be able to plug into a business network. Uh, existing business networks that are, that are already in place that allow access, of, access to information across multiple enterprises, uh, across multiple parts of, uh, of the world, multiple geographies, multiple languages, and also be able to support multiple verticals. Because if you think about uh, the, the construction or any of the projects that you're trying to put together, they're not necessarily single discipline type projects or, or involve just a single vertical around oil and gas. There's a lot of work that's around high tech, around systems, around monitoring, around uh, uh, wireless technologies and things like that. So being able to support these at, at a wide range of uh, customers, wide range of use cases, wide range of industries. In addition, one of the other things that a, a typical network provides is accessibility to multiple parties, multiple stakeholders across the network. So if you think about the, the process that a network is trying to model, it is going to look for the, the, the ability to connect all the way from opportunity identification through feed, detail design, procurement, logistics, construction across all the stakeholders uh, that are involved in, in getting a project out into the mix. Right? So if you look at this, this, this uh, particular graphic, what this shows you is the project pool uh, uh, pipe spool plan, but the idea really is across the board there are horizontal stripes of people that are involved um, and also different different parts of the process that these people are involved in. So the key really is how do you model in the network a process that allows a common view across what is happening across all the stakeholders that are responsible for delivering the project or accomplishing a task. Um, so this is again not very difficult. I mean, the, the key really here is each one of these entities, whether you look at the EPCs, subcontractors, suppliers, they do have visibility into their portion of the, of the, of the network or their portion of the activity. So in the next couple of slides, what you would see is a representation of what this particular thing looks like. Uh, for instance, for the logistics provider, what does that network look like? Um, if you look at, uh, for the owner, what this network looks like, as well as for the, the, the actual EPC that's, that's running the procurement, that's running the, uh, the, the installation, what it looks like. The key really here is uh, how do you actually stitch these things together? So step two is really to be able to look at and tap into the various quote unquote networks, business networks of all these stakeholders, uh, owners as, as one, overlay that on top of the network that an EPC would have, uh, overlay that on top of the network that a supplier would have, and be able to provide a common view across all these quote unquote networks. Now I'll, I'll pause here to, to clarify. What we're talking about here is not necessarily technology or information sharing networks. What we're really talking about here is the business networks. The ability to connect multiple stakeholders, let's say through an EPC and provide a view into what are the key transactions, key business processes, key uh, steps in the, in the installation process, in the, in the project planning process, in the project execution process that somebody like a supplier or somebody like an owner or the stakeholder needs to be aware of, right? So a clear distinction between not, not necessarily tapping into the, the technical uh, IT related network architecture or the systems, but really being able to extract the relevant business pieces of that information as and when um, the, the, the stakeholders provide them through a secure interface. Right, so once, once if you, Think about step two. Step one was data acquisition or access to data. Step two was being able to provide the context around data acquisition. So convert, step one was getting data. Step two was converting the data into information. Step three is really looking at the bigger, bigger process and the project itself. So what does it take to actually execute the process? 
whether it is the project plan, whether it's design, whether it's material movements, whether it's the assembly, whether it's the installation, whether it's the construction, how do you tie that back into events that happen in, in that particular process, in that particular uh, execution of that project? The idea really being that this really, if you think about it, is setting up the plan around what kind of materials need to be moved, what kind of services need to be provided, when the material needs to be acquired, um, all in the context of what is the what is the plan that you want to execute and how you want to track that. So here's, here's if you think about it, overlaying that in, uh, in, in terms of a familiar Gantt chart representation of the project, how, how do you figure out where material is going to be consumed, where services are, need, uh, are, are going to be completed, and as, as a result, when the next steps need to happen around around the uh, integrated um, um, material management processes, right? So this is really step two. Sorry, step three. From step three, you actually move into step four, which is really how do you monitor once you have the plan in place in step three? How do you monitor whether that plan is going to be executed or not? And the plan execution is primarily driven by transactions around material movement requests or service requisitions. Um, and then tracking the completion of those uh, material movements, the completion of those services, as well as receipt and inventory of those materials and services. So the, exam the, the example that you see here is around purchase orders, shipments, receipts, uh, which talk about physical material, but the same thing could apply to service requisitions as well as the completion of the service requests. So the idea really being that step three, you come up with a plan on how you want to execute these material moves. Step four, you're actually monitoring these material moves and putting them back in the in the context of that bigger project plan. So uh, what you see next is a view into what that project plan looks like. And what it shows you is what was the planned um, movement, what was the planned ships, what were the planned service authorizations. And it also tells you, uh, as a part of step four, where you are against the plan that you actually uh, came up with in step, step three. Now, the key to all this is this is actually a shared view into the network, right? So as suppliers, as all the stakeholders are executing their portion of the, of the, of the process, the step five is really connecting it all together and trying to figure out what is the impact of, let's say, a particular delay or a particular non-event, and how do you resolve that? And who actually is responsible? How can you in the network resolve that exception? So in this particular example, what you see is work orders, purchase orders, shipments, um, receipts, um, followed by shipments, followed by receipts again. How are they all connected across all the stakeholders, whether it be the owners, the suppliers, whether it be the carriers that are moving the materials around or the EPCs that are actually executing it? How are they all related? And as a result, if an, if an activity happens or if an activity gets delayed, if a material does not arrive on time or if a material does not ship on time, what is really the impact of that on the broader process? So the key really here is to be able to quickly identify if a non-event uh, if a non-event uh, is, is detected or a delayed event is detected, whether it be around service requisitions or whether it be around uh, material moves, how can you assess whether the, that particular event or non-event is on the critical path? And if it is, how do you go about resolving it in the network? If it is not on the critical path, then you essentially have enough slack for the overall plan to not pour in money and, and maybe run an expedite on that process. So this is really a view, step five, really gives you a view, end-to-end -end view across what is really going on across all the stakeholders at, that are involved in accomplishing a project and what is the relative priority of uh, not being able to track to the original plan and how do you go about resolving that in, in the network, right? So if you think about it, uh, if you go on to the next slide, what this really talks about is, is really the overlay in terms of how do you assess, uh, and when, when you talk about monitoring, the two broad categories, right, around which you want to assess whether that project is being executed. Um, one is whether it's on budget. The second is whether it's on time, right? So views like this that are monitoring individual transactions, individual activities across the stakeholders, across the tasks that need to be accomplished on the project, are really critical. And what you see here is really a point of view on how can you look at both services and material and track them around availability, around on time, as well as around cost, and be able to aggregate, really quickly aggregate that up at the project level, at the activity level, at the task level, uh, all the way up and down based on uh, individual transactions that are flowing through the network. The goal really being that uh, if, you, if you take a step back, this is really the view that we want to put on the, on the existing business network. So as information is being exchanged across the entire network, be able to highlight where the, where the shipments are running late, 
where the reschedule of the service is required, and as a result, very quickly be able to notify all the stakeholders that are responsible for either expediting that material or rescheduling that, surf that service. You're gave, giving them advanced visibility or quicker visibility into really what's going on in the network. Right? So kind of going back to the point that Rich was making, if, if information is always lagging the material moves, then you're essentially second guessing and building buffers into the network. What we're really talking about here is an approach to actually look at this problem around information sharing, around aligning information with material availability through a network-based approach where information and material move together or, or very close to each other. And as a result, the relevant stakeholders are very quickly notified on what happens if that particular material or that service is not performed on time or does not, uh, does not uh, get acted upon in time, right? So what, what we're really going to think as a, ne as a next step, what, what we, I'm going to really walk you through is a couple of things that we think uh, a point of view on how stakeholders would interact with this integrated materials management process. Um, first and foremost is when you have the ability to actually represent information and represent the business process in a network, you have the opportunity to actually have a single version of the tr truth that can be shared across all the stakeholders in the network. Now, by that, what I mean is not every information is available to everybody. What it really means is there's one version of the truth that has been sliced uh, or been made available based on the quote-unquote role that a particular stakeholder plays in the broader project uh, planning and the broader project execution process. So the view that we're proposing here is, number one, it has a role-based view. So a common view across a common place to access all this information, but what information a stakeholder gets access to is partition based on roles. Uh, the second extremely important thing is once, once you are collecting all this information in the network, how do you actually slice and dice it and run it by exceptions? And those exceptions, uh, how do you find the needle in the haystack, right? So to kind of quote a, a, a phrase here, the, the slice and dice and get to those needle in the haystack is really driven around three broad categories. How are you tracking around your financial metrics? How are you tracking around your performance metrics? And then how are you tracking around your overall operational metrics? All these three things have to be working in sync and they have to be accessible through to all stakeholders, or all the relevant stakeholders through a role-based uh, permission uh, framework. They have to be both backward looking as well as forward looking. So be able to look at what happened in the past and learn from the past, as well as look at where you are right now and be able to project into the future and see where the, where the potential problems could occur. Uh, be proactive in terms of exceptions and alerts. So rather than looking for thousands of transactions and looking at every single one of them to figure out whether there's a problem with that particular transaction or that particular step, be able to have it run based on exceptions be able to quickly sort, filter, aggregate up and down the item hierarchy, uh, the regional hierarchy, be able to do a lot of those slice and dices really quickly. And the third extremely important thing is to be able to drill down, up and down. So when you're looking at an aggregate view and you look at materials being constrained in a particular region, be able to quickly drill down and figure out what is the impact of that particular constraint, uh, material constraint in that particular geography. Is it localized to a particular site? or is it across the multiple sites in that particular region? So be able to very quickly go up and down so that you can make intelligent operational decisions across that, across all stakeholders. Uh, and the last part here is very, very important. It is not just about acquiring information in the network very, very quickly. It is also being able to do concurrent computations to figure out what is the impact of that information vis-a-vis uh, -vis the overall project. Well, is the project running on time? Is it on budget? And if it is not, how do I acquire the right information? How do I share the right information across the stakeholders to be able to perform that perform that uh, task and be able to get that back on track? Right. So if you think about it, uh, these are really the key building blocks that we think uh, are are extremely important. Now, the the other building block that's extremely important is making sure that there is accessibility of information, accessibility for participation across all stakeholders. Um, so not just being able to provide system-to-system -system connectivity through EDI, through standards-based information technologies, but also be able to provide uh, the ability to pe for people that are not sophisticated, that are, that are in remote sites that don't have access to sophisticated information technology, to be able to access the system, to be able to perform and act and provide information on the system, on this business network, and be able to be, make intelligent decisions. So have 
the ability to connect mu multiple stakeholders, multiple parties to acquire information, to share information, and continue to move forward. So extremely important for having this sort of a connectivity backbone. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we recommend um, as, as we go forward um, as, a, as a reference architecture is something like this, which is instead of having a point-to-point -point integration framework that allows, uh, let's say, connecting one protocol and one payload into the other protocol, other payload, having a, having a canonical-based approach or a reference architecture to data connectivity to information sharing is, is extremely critical to make sure that there is success. And this is this is something that has that that has been proven in in, in other uh, industries and other verticals as well, uh, where you're loosely decoupling the information sharing through a canonical that sits in the middle. And that what this really does is make sure that the the technology that you're putting in place is scalable, not just in terms of data acquisition, but also in terms of data sharing. And having predefined connectors into on-premise applications. Um, like ERPs, like planning systems, like CAD systems, like scheduling and, and, and project management systems, uh, but also on the other side, standards-based integration to connect to partners, stakeholders that are providing information across logistics, across procurement, across construction, across uh, design, uh, all those available through multiple standards as well as custom and, and, and flat files and Excel uploads and downloads. Right? The key really here is through the canonical, this is really your reference for mapping everything into a centralized place and being able to provide a consolidated view across that entire network, right? So it's not just about data, but it's also about the process that the, connect, that the canonical is aware of and moves forward. Uh, so this is really, uh, in, in our mind, uh, a, a quick reference uh, architecture for, for enabling some of these business network type based approaches uh, and making them successful. Right, if you move on to the next slide, as we walk through the, the business network, as we have walked through these five steps, step one being data acquisition, step two being providing the information context across the stakeholders in the network, step three being able to come up with a joint view of what the plan needs to be for the project, step four need, need, needs to be having uh, and monitoring the execution, and step five being able to resolve exceptions, all in the network. For this to be successful, what you really need is a business network, right? And and when you look at a business network, we there are ten key attributes that we think are extremely important. Uh, the first one being the security of the of the hosting and the software infrastructure. Extremely important because you're running your entire business. It has to be scalable and it has to go across multiple parties, multiple transactions. The second part is these the, the information the business network is running a mission critical application. So the service levels need to be extremely high, uh, all the way from 99.5 uh, higher onwards. Uh, number three is having many-to-many, -many, uh, a data model that supports a many-to-many -many connectivity. So we talked about requisitions, purchase orders, shipments, receipts, returns, invoices, all being represented in multiple ways across stakeholders, all being represented and exchanged across multiple uh, data formats. The, the business network needs to be able to support a many-to-many -many, uh, capability to map them from one to the other, to be able to align the business process. Number four, you need an event-driven state model to trigger alerts, workflows, and, and, and planning and re resolution algorithms. Uh, this is really extremely important. So the event-driven state model is really how you tie back the transactions, the plan, to the execution, to the exceptions. And state models are typically uh, things that, that really set the thresholds around exceptions, that set the business process rules around exceptions, and they're also scalable in the sense that once you are able to put a state model in place, you can almost have a library of these state models that you can pick and choose from, and, and you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. Our approach to, uh, w w as, as we go into this um, uh, IMM project, one of the things that we would be developing is these, uh, a library of these state models around use cases uh, that we discuss and prioritize. Uh, number five is really the role-based authentication. Uh, how do you make sure that there is secure access to the information that is being exchanged and, and uh, non-authenticated um, non parties don't have access to it? Permission framework to be able to slice and dice the single version of the truth and still be able to share that information across all the stakeholders by company, by project, by role, by region. Uh, extremely important from a, from a scalability of the business network. Um, the next key part of this is to be able to look at other business processes and stitch in other processes, other siloed processes into the same single process. So a lot of companies have 
siloed uh, processes around procurement, around logistics, around project planning, around design, the ability for a business network to stitch all these together and provide an end-to-end -end view is extremely critical. And this is one of the big things that you need to look at for a business, from a business network standpoint. Uh, number eight is the ability to connect to multiple on-premise systems uh, through a library of adapters and connectors. So one of the things that, that we realize is as these projects are, are commissioned and then rolled off and moved into other phases, there are different ERPs, different backend systems, different uh, on-premise systems that can be connected. And be able to do that really quickly to acquire data is, is critical for these, these things to work, right? So extremely important for us to have that as a part of the network. Uh, number nine is the ability to reach all trading partners regardless of the te technical sophistication. So a key premise of this business network is to make sure that all the relevant stakeholders, all the required stakeholders have access to information and can provide information and more importantly can interact within the business network and perform collaboratively uh, and make decisions. So having the ability to reach all trading partners is, is extremely, extremely important. Um, and number 10, finally, is for, for this network to be successful, the, the, the stakeholders that have high activity, that manage a lot of transactions, that have, deal with a lot of information exchange, have to have the ability to quickly connect systems together and be able to have a scalable framework using the, the canonical-based reference architecture is extremely critical for a business network uh, to, be, to, to support a reusable framework uh, around plug and play for stakeholders uh, across that entire network. So once, once an EPC is connected, once a, a, a stakeholder is connected, how can you reuse some of those connections? How can you reuse the payload? How can you reuse that is extremely important from a business network standpoint. What we, what again, from a typical IMM project standpoint, what we, what we look at is, is business benefits around five broad areas, uh, around the, the purchase price variance, driving that down. Better visibility to material and materials management. Um, there, is, there, is ability, there is opportunity to uh, aggregate spend, leverage volumes across multiple projects. Again, the key to that is having visibility into those, those processes. Uh, being able to drive material and labor costs. Um, again, being able to, to deploy material that's sitting, possibly waiting for labor, or being able to ma manage labor better. Uh, reducing inventory costs, better materials management, better visibility into materials across that entire network. Uh, being able to account for material that's sitting on a ship and moving for four weeks as a part of a projected available inventory is extremely critical to drive some of the inventory costs down. Uh, reducing expedites, so uh, if, if material is not on a critical path, if service is not on a critical path, having that visibility and reducing the, the overhead or, or the extra drive to expedite that material, extremely important. Um, and then finally, user productivity. Uh, being able to manage that entire process by exception is extremely critical. The technology does exist to, to model business process rules, uh, event-based state models to allow that, and, and that really is, is critical for this. And again, if you think about it, the three broad categories around business benefits, around visibility, coordination, and orchestration, uh, extremely important as we, as we think about uh, the materials management system, as we think about an approach to solving this materials management problem. Right? Now, in, in, in conclusion, before I hand it over to Rich, uh, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, we, from an IMM standpoint, again, this is, this is a pretty broad scope uh, of, of activities. Um, and this is something that has been, and Martin touched upon this when, he, when we kicked off this workshop, this has been addressed in other industries. I think there's opportunity for us to, to absorb some of the learnings from other industries and adapt it to the oil and gas. Uh, but that said, we don't necessarily have to go through all five steps in one shot. I mean, there is, there is finding the relevant problem, finding the relevant use cases, building, the, building a solution set out for them, building the, the state models for them, building a, a point of view for them. And from there, continuing to build step one through step five is really the key, I think, uh, to getting getting this this materials management initiative uh, around Fiatech off the ground. So we're we're extremely excited and look forward to collaborating with the, with the Fiatech team and the broader participation on this call um, and kicking this off forward. With that, I'll hand it over to Rich. Yeah, thanks, Pawan. Uh, so um, to conclude our portion of this, I, I'd just like to summarize. Uh, some of the key points I think that uh, have been made. I think the first one is is that this the whole notion of a supply chain um, is, is important. Um, that they have really merged into become networks, and 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 I think that the more we start thinking about um, our materials management processes in the terms of of, of a network, the, the the sooner we do that, the better off we're going to be. Uh, we we do know that materials management processes. Um, um, 
need real-time data because we can make uh, more proactive decisions, we can reduce inventory, we can improve productivity as, as Pawan mentioned. So real-time information is, is, is very important and that means having participation within the network. Uh, project execution in the end is a collaboration among multiple parties um, to make a successful project uh, come in on time and on budget. And within that, um, we have to understand that the context of all those activities is really everything. And so that means that sort of information now is sort of becomes the new money. And as we look at information that powers these systems, we realize that we can improve uh, uh, project uh, construction performance, uh, reduce costs, um, and improve profitability. So with that, uh, one of the things I'd like to just note is that um, we have a ebook um, that we will be sending out to all the registrants um, of, the, of the webinar and uh, it, it will be made available within a week or so. So I want to thank you all for your participation and your interest and with that I'd like to turn it over to Reg. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rich. And I, I, I really enjoyed the, the topic and I, I want to run a couple quick questions by you, but I just wanted to highlight for everyone the cross section of different companies that have signed up for the webinar. And as you can see, there's, there's actually over 85 companies that have signed up, which is quite a great cross section. And I'm sure hopefully you can read it well enough that you, your eyes are traversing across the lists of names. And so there's, there's actually multiple others that are involved. Uh, next slide. So during the registration process, all of you know that you were asked a number of questions that really wasn't to intrude in your privacy, but it was to give us a better familiarity on the nature of the audience. And, and I'd just like to highlight a couple of things very quickly. Um, what I think is nice, and Martin had already touched on, is that 80% of you uh, uh, have familiarity with material management on large capital projects, and you rank that to 80 to, uh, to moderate to high. And do you understand the limitations and deficiencies of existing material management process, 77%? So you can see right there that you know the knowledge about what our systems do and what their limitations are is critical for us to be able to realize integrated material management going forward. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So, uh, 75% of you indicated an interest in uh, integrated material management ses sessions at the FIATEC member meeting. Uh, you've been sent a notification of where that is. We'll be sending a follow-up email to everyone about those kinds of things. And 72% uh, would be interested in participating in a project to realize integrated material management. Uh, uh, excuse me, 76%, and also we'll be conducting a forum in Houston probably first quarter of next year, and we'll be laying that out. And uh, so let's go to the last line. So uh, again, my name is Reg Hunter. You can reach me on Skype with hunter.reg or hunter at fiatech.org, as you see. Um, we have a member meeting, which is members only, in uh, coming up in Philadelphia, September 29th to the 1st, um, that we have sessions related to integrated material management and advanced work packaging, along with a number of other interesting topics. Uh, we do have a presence in Europe. Um, there's, a there's a projects meeting and uh, efficiency through digital projects uh, in London on the 30th and 31st of October. And then um, obviously it'd be great if you'd be interested in participating in the upcoming um, Houston IMM forum. So um, we'd like you to get involved in the FIATEC IMM project and we'd like you to, to attend future web webinars. We actually, this is just one of a series of webinars. We've identified 10 already that represent enabling systems and technologies that are critical to us being able to achieve integrated materials management. So that having been said, let me real quick run a couple questions by you that I received, uh, Rich. Um, one of the one of the questions was, what is meant by real time exception management, and is this exist as an effort to deal with risk uh, risk reduction and mitigation when during a process execution? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, real time, you know, basically means um, fresh data. So think of it in in terms of um, how often does the data change? So, for example, if at a receiving location, maybe a laydown yard, that the information um, is actually logged maybe twice a day. So, real time in that sense um, is twice a day. Uh, real time can be, you know, up to the minute if if it's valuable. So, it will change depending on the the uh, location of the node and then the processes that support it. But uh, the the the, the basic concept is, is that the more fresh or accurate the information is, the more trustworthy that the plans 
and the commitments are that are made behind that. Okay, uh, we had a question wanting to know a little bit more about E2 Open's um, uh, E2 Open's involvement in other industries and credentials, kind of like that. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Sure. So E2 Open um, has been around uh, 15 years. Um, and it was uh, formed by um, several large companies uh, that, you know, identified this problem of global collaboration and coordination as an issue as they started to globalize their supply chains, use more and more partners, um, and, and really um, losing control of their supply chain. So the task they gave to E2Open was to go figure out how to enable visibility and collaboration uh, and then be able to augment uh, uh, capabilities such as planning and response management uh, within their companies by utilizing uh, real-time data and by you know having full interaction with all the participants in the process. So, so can you give us a feel for just how many uh, how many uh, I don't know the right way to pose this question, but how big your your network is now? Yes. Um, so there's 39,000 uh, companies that are in the network now and hundreds of thousands of, of, of actual users. Um, generally what we find, um, even as we go into new industries, is that uh, a majority, if not most, of the trading partners are already a node on the network. And so we're very familiar with uh, the information protocols and, and how to get information from various partners. And that does have a big impact in terms of building out the, the, the process capabilities and being able to uh, get information in a B2B sense. So, you know, having a broad footprint like uh, Powell described earlier is really important in terms of being able to jumpstart um, an improvement program like integrated materials management because, you know, that starting from scratch can take years to develop. And by being able to leverage something like that right out of the chute, you're working then immediately on process innovation as opposed to plumbing. Good. Well, there's only two more things here real quick. What, uh, sorry, we're running a minute or two long here. Um, what um, d does – it wasn't abundantly clear, I guess, to some of the people participating uh, in the webinar that, you know, how do you – can you provide opportunities to provide views across different projects? Uh, yes. So basically that's all done when the projects are modeled in terms of the configuration that is done uh, between projects. So let's say, for example, that there is a function that um, is serving multiple projects. Probably it'll be procurement, logistics, and perhaps others. Um, and if there is common data that is required in those multiple projects, that's just simply a matter of making those associations between the projects and then making sure that the the, the roles and the users are, are appropriately configured in order to be able to see that information. So it really is up to the, it's up to the, uh, um, the, the, let's say the leader of the project to determine how much visibility they want to grant, to whom they want to give it to, and how they want them to interact. And they can certainly toggle that on and off depending on phases of the project or depending on their particular needs. Um, you know, sometimes it'll be a lot of visibility and interaction, and sometimes it'll be very narrow. And uh, it's the kind of thing that sort of changes with the phases of a project um, so that it adapts to, uh, you know, what a project leader needs at that moment. Yeah. Well, uh, not, sorry, the questions keep flowing in here. And by the way, if we don't get to your answer your questions, we'll be sending you a follow-up response anyway. But uh, another question I think that's real important and it always comes up is that, uh, an individual was asking is how do you balance between there's a lot of information that's considered to be uh, sensitive or IP for example pricing a unique design specifications or some other form of intellectual property and how do you how do you envision this cloud-based system coping with that you know that's a great question um, it's uh, it's it's key it's key to making this whole thing work really I mean Sometimes people think of networks like Facebook, which is really not right. I mean, um, what networks can be is they can be partitioned in a, such a way such that there is private level of information flowing between partners that absolutely cannot be compromised and can be isolated in such a way that there is a complete assurance that um, that information is, is not going to be uh, uh, is you know not going to be compromised in any way. Um, then there are other kinds of information that can be you know, based in a more multi-tenant kind of an environment. And that is 
you know, where the risk of loss of the information is much, much lower. It's less sensitive than, say, pricing information or, say, uh, uh, approved suppliers or, or contracts or things of that nature that we really want in a much, much more secure uh, architecture. So the idea to be able to do it in a hybrid way, to be able to do, you know, a private kind of a network and merge that with a public network approach is really critical because that in the end is 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 how you make it work um, and trying to you know make a one-size-fit-all uh, approach is is usually problematic right uh, I just like to make a couple real quick comments I did get some questions about you know fiat tech always strikes a balance between trying to essentially demonstrate in, in an unambiguous way the validity of a technology or system